Oh, I'll work quick. Okay, our next talk is on diagnosing compiler performance uh, issues. Take away. Hi, uh, my name is Andrei Peshimut, and I also work with David Wolpolzer and Peter Tuma. This talk is about diagnosing performance issues in production JIT compilers. We implemented this approach for the GraalVM compiler, but it should be transferable to many other similar systems. First, consider the performance characteristics of an application running on the JVM. It's rather complicated, and this is due to several factors. First, we usually start executing a method in the interpreter. The interpreter collects profiles. When the method is invoked many times, it gets compiled by a tier one compiler that also produces instrumented code that collects profiles. And when the method is uh, invoked even more times, it gets compiled by the tier two compiler that uses the profiles to do optimization decisions and um, it should lead to basically the profiles allow the compiler to make better decisions which leads to faster code usually. The tier two compiler can, is also allowed to do speculative optimizations like it can speculate that uh, an operation doesn't throw an exception and when this, when this speculation is violated, uh, the code is discarded, we continue in the interpreter, then we collect more profiles and maybe later the method gets recompiled with different profiles and different optimization decisions and we get different performance. All right, so I tried to convince you that the system is rather complex and a production dynamic compiler has several commits merge every day and this combination leads to performance regressions. To avoid these regressions, we periodically measure a set of representative workloads. We have an example of such measurements on the slide. The x-axis is a revision of the compiler, and the y-axis are the results of the measurements, basically the time it takes to, uh, takes to finish a repetition of the workload. We can clearly see in this case that there was a performance regression and this is what the talk is about. We have some version of the compiler before and after the regression and we want to answer what is the cause of the regression. The cause is often linked to an optimization decision which means for example the compiler used to inline a particular method in some workload before the regression and after that regression, it stopped inlining that particular method in a workload. So this is the kind of answer that compiler engineers expect to make the heuristics in the compiler more robust to these changes, for example, in the profiles. And it's not just about inlining. There are tens of different optimization passes in the compiler that perform optimization decisions. So how could we diagnose a, such a problem? The first idea that you might have is to look at the change code, look at the code level changes. However, we found that the, commit, the, the committed code is often clearly unrelated to the true cause. This is due to the complexity of the system. Another option is we can look at the IR. We have an example of the IR on the slide. However, it usually contains thousands of IR nodes per compilation unit. So just by looking at the graphs and diffing the graphs, we cannot find the issue. Therefore, our approach is the following. The idea is simple. We capture and compare the compiler's behavior. So starting from the left, we have some workload on which we regress, and we have a revision before and after the regression. What we do is we run the affected workload on both these revisions of the compiler. We attach a profiler to the VM, which will tell us what are the most frequently executed compilation units. Basically, what machine code the, the VM is executing most of the time. And we also ask the compiler to produce optimization logs, which is something that we crafted specially for this purpose. The optimization logs contain a tree for each compilation unit, and the tree describes the compiler's behavior, the optimization decisions in that compilation unit as a tree. 
Then we made a tool called profdiv that loads these logs and profiles and for the frequently executed compilation units, it compares the trees semantically. The result is some textual report that shows the differences between the trees and a compiler engineer can read these reports and they should be able to figure out what is the issue. All right, so to illustrate how this works, how we collect the trees, how we compare them, I'll show an example workload that we'll try to optimize. And I'll show how we record the trees. So this is a very simple workload that takes, uh, it's a method called for each neighbor that takes a 2D grid as an argument, a starting position in the grid, and some callback. And basically, it invokes the callback for each neighbor of the starting position. All right, so this is just the workload that we are trying to optimize, and I'll show how we record the trees for the optimization. Basically, this workload should be pretty much equivalent to the code that you can see on the right. The code on the left uses some, it allocates some objects, there's a for loop, and there are some method calls. The code on the right doesn't use this. So the compiler should be able to optimize these allocations, method calls, and the for loop away. And this is how we start, this is how we record the optimizations. At the beginning of the compilation, we build this tree that basically reflects the compilation unit that we are compiling and all the calls that are in the, in the method. So we have a root, which is the root of the compilation unit, and we have the calls to methods at x and y, and it says direct in front of them because these are simple direct invocations, and we have a call to method accept, and it says indirect because there's dynamic dispatch. And I'll show three optimization passes, inline and escape analysis, loop unrolling, and I'll show how we record all these optimizations, and I'll also show the intermediate code that represents what the compiler is doing in the middle. So first we simply inline the calls to these methods that are easily inlineable, like the call to the add method x and y, and method add, we simply replace the calls with the body of, of the target method. And in the tree on the right, we record these optimizations, and you can see that uh, for these three calls, it says inline because we inline these calls. And then comes escape analysis, and escape analysis is uh, pretty much trying to put as much allocations on the stack instead of the heap, because this is more efficient. Uh, escape analysis determines all the allocations that do not escape the inline scope. So an allocation could escape by saving and storing an object to a static field or passing an object to a method that was not inline. In this case, the in this case escape analysis determines that all of these allocations that are highlighted on the left, they do not escape. We can place them on the stack. So we recorded that. Uh, in the tree on the right. So we recorded the fact that we can place these allocations on the stack. Uh, each, of these, each of these has an individual node in the tree on the right. Uh, the middle shows that uh, there's basically no way to force stack allocation in Java yet, so I borrowed a bit of C++ syntax here. And you can also see that the tree on the right it reflects the optimizations that the compiler performed, the optimization decisions like stack allocation, and it also reflects the inlining decisions, and this, is, this all follows the structure of the inlined code. Then last optimization we wanna do and record that in the tree is, is the for loop. Uh, the for loop does always only four iterations, so we can get rid of the loop by replacing it with four copies of its own body. We do that in the middle, and we record that, that fact that we did loop unrolling in the tree on the right, so it says loop unrolling line 11. As a side effect of the unrolling, we made four copies of the call to the accept method, so we have four nodes in, on the right side. All right, so this is the end of the baseline compilation. 
I promised that we could get rid of all these allocations and all, all the unnecessary method calls and the for loop, so we just did that and we recorded that as the tree on the right. This tree on the right be, will be part of our optimization logs, then we can later diff with other logs. Now let's, let's consider some regression scenario. Suppose that there is a bug in the inliner and will basically, um, that will lead to a different compilation outcome. We will fail to optimize all this code and we'll record it as a different tree, which we can later compare with the baseline compilation. So again, we'll go through th three phases, inlining, escape analysis, and loop unrolling. So first we inline the calls to methods X and Y, we record that in the tree on the right. We do not inline the add method and suppose that this is the bug, that there's some bug in the compiler's heuristics and it leads to the fact that we do not inline the method add. Then comes escape analysis. We can still place the allocation of the array on the stack, but we fail to get rid, uh, get rid of the indexes because these objects escape as arguments to the method add, which was now not in line. So we do not record anything in the tree. And also the add method would now be compiled separately as a separate compilation unit. But you can also see that the allocation escapes from that method as a, as a return value. Therefore, we also have to place the allocation on the stack, on, on the heap. Finally, um, loop unrolling, we can still get rid of the for loop by replacing it with four copies of its own body. We record a fact in the tree on the right that we did the loop unrolling. Now as a side effect, we now have four copies of the call to the add method and also four copies of the call to the accept method so the tree on the right reflects that. All right, so this is the end of the regress compilation where we had a bug in the inliner that led to a different compilation outcome we could not place all the allocations on the stack and we recorded that as a tree on the right. So let's put these trees side by side from the baseline compilation where, where we could optimize everything as we wanted and the tree from the regress compilation. Remember that these trees are part of the optimization logs and if these compilation units are frequently executed according to our profiles, our tool will give us the differences. So the, this is the tool's output, and it clearly shows the differences between these two compilations. It says that there was a different inlining decision for the add method. It was inlined in the baseline compilation, but we failed to inline the method in the, in the regress compilation. There were all these allocations that we could place on the stack in the baseline compilation, but we failed to do so in the regress compilation. And we also have these calls that were duplicated in the regress compilation as part of the, due to the loop unrolling. All right, so this is the tree that is the output of the tool and it clearly shows the differences and also the parts of the compilation that were unchanged. There's one more thing. Consider the method add. Method add was inlined in the method for each neighbor, so it was compiled as part of the big compilation unit before the regression, but after the regression, we compiled method add separately as a dedicated compilation unit. So the compiler could have optimized these, this big compilation unit and this dedicated compilation unit differently in the two runs, so we would like to see the differences in optimization. Therefore, we have from the baseline compilation, we have this tree that describes all the optimizations in the big compilation unit and from the regressed compilation, we have just this small tree that is just a single node that describes all the optimizations in the dedicated compilation unit. The tree is just a single node because in this case there were no optimization decisions. To compare these, we simply create a subtree, we call that a compilation fragment, and we can compare these directly. And the result is the following. Basically, it says that before the regression, we could, in the inline method, we could place the allocation on the stack, but we failed to do this in 
in the regress compilation where we had a dedicated compilation unit for the method. All right, so this is the end of the examples. The examples are rather simple, so you may wonder what the trees look like in practice. This is a tree that describes optimizations from some random benchmark that we use to track the performance of, of GraalVM. This, is, this describes all the optimizations and all the inlining decisions in a single compilation unit. We usually have something like five to 10 hot compilation units that we really care about in, in, in a run of the, of the VM. So we also put the test, put the tool to a test with some real data. The Renaissance benchmark suite used to track the performance of the Graal VM compiler. And in this suite, there were uh, six unstable workloads. So that means there were six benchmarks that were randomly faster or slower on each VM invocations, on each VM invocation. So whenever we invoke the VM, the workload would end up being randomly faster or slower. Therefore, we used our tool to diagnose these issues. We found the actual concrete optimization decisions that were responsible for the slowdowns in these workloads. And we could also confirm that the optimization decisions that we identified were really responsible for the slowdowns. And we could easily confirm that by running the VM uh, with, a, with a VM option to, in, to, to override the optimization decisions. All of the optimization decisions that we found, all of the issues were related to inlining. So we had to just force the VM to inline or not inline a particular method in a workload. And we got speed ups from eight to 30% on each of these workloads. And one of these issues that we identified is already fixed in production. All of the tooling, uh, all of the modifications to the Graal VM compiler are merged, merged to the upstream repository. And thank you. This is the end of the presentation. You got time for one question? Sure. So there is a, a kind of maybe well-known technique where if you have, uh, if, like if you look at all the transformations that are done over the course of an optimization in order, then you can um, do a binary search on those and say, if I only do the first half of them and don't do the second half, then do I still see the regression or the bug or whatever and narrow in on those. So there is a, like an argument in some cases for instead of having a tree-based approach, having a chronological like list of all the things. Um, do you have a sense of to what extent representing this as a tree and doing a tree diff gained you an advantage versus just having like a in order list of what ch choices you had made? Yes, thank you for the question. The first implementation that we had, it, it was also a tree, but it follows the, the structure of the compiler and it was some kind of a chronological order. It's basically the tree just described the optimization phases that the compiler runs and all of the optimizations, uh, but we found that pretty hard to read. So basically the problem, as you saw, is inlining. So we really care about the structure of the inline code because each time you invoke the VM, you might get different inlining decisions and that will lead to different optimizations so therefore, we often want to compare uh, a sub part of a compilation unit, which we call a compilation fragment, with a dedicated compilation unit in another run. So uh, the trees make that really easy because the optimization decisions and basically follow the structure of the inline code in the tree. So to compare a part of the compilation unit with another compilation unit, we just have to take a subtree. From, from our tree that we built. Okay. Cool, thanks. I think we've got time for one more question. If Did you have to modify the compiler to collect the information or was it already done using some debugs and you just collected it? 
Yes, basically I went through all the optimization phases in the compiler and whenever the compiler performed some optimization, some transformation, I added some call to my method uh, to lock the, the optimization. Okay, thank you. Do you think you could use this on other compilers? Like, like, so this seems like a completely general technique to sort of finding problems. Y yes, I mean, um, we could build something on top of this that would uh, semi-automatically try uh, what what optimization differences could be responsible for for the performance differences, like uh, some tool to automatically run the workload and override some optimizations. The problem is that there's really no technique to do that in the compiler to generally override any optimization decision. And yeah, there are some other technical difficulties. Cool. Okay, let's thank the speaker.